Welcome to Texas Heart Institute uh, educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. We have a special opportunity today uh, as a guest. Uh, Dr. Stephen R. Bailey is our guest. Uh, welcome to Texas Heart Institute at Houston. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. You're welcome. He is a professor and chairman of the Department of Internal Medicine and also Professor Emeritus at the University of uh, Texas Health, San Antonio. Currently, he is in Shreveport, and he is Professor of Medicine at LSU Health School. I am. So, today's topic uh, of uh, this discussion and your presentation is related to cardiogenic shock, and uh, particularly on the updates and challenges now, today, in 2020. Yeah. You gave an excellent presentation at our Texas Heart Institute Grand Rounds, cardiology Grand Rounds on this particular topic. And we would greatly appreciate if you could summarize to us your current uh, opinion and uh, information available on the status and advances in treatment of cardiogenic shock. Thank you. Dr. Bailey, if you would be so kind, can you uh, describe to us what is cardiogenic shock and what is the classification of shock and how do we differentiate cardiogenic shock from other shock conditions? So cardiogenic shock is one of the four types of shock. Uh, that includes distributive, which is the most frequent. It includes obstructive, the least frequent. And it is divided uh, along with hypovolemic shock uh, as the other uh, uh, of those components. The definition we use is one that's been around since 1955. It's pretty straightforward. It's, it, does a patient have a blood pressure that is less than 90, doesn't respond to fluids? It may be that they've had a drop of more than 30 millimeters from their baseline. We have to remember that. It should be defined as secondary to cardiac dysfunction, not something else. And we can characterize it more closely by evidence of lack of uh, forward cardiac output, so does the cardiac index less than 2.2, or is there evidence of, of congestion, elevated left ventricular pressure with an LVEDP that's greater than 15, making sure that the patient isn't hypovolemic. Excellent. So uh, can you uh, mention to us some key considerations in diagnosis and management of cardiogenic shock? Uh, absolutely. So cardiogenic shock is something that comes up frequently and the first question you want to make if you're deciding how to treat it, is this really cardiogenic shock? One of the other forms uh, that would be treated differently. If it is, they need to think about how severe it is because this is a continuum. In fact, you can have uh, early forms that may be a little bit of a problem or you may have really severe forms that are major problems and, and may not in fact be treatable. So to define that, you want to think about what's involved. Is it the left ventricle? Is it the right ventricle? Is it both of those that are having problems? And lastly, based upon that assessment, how severe and what's involved, you can develop a treatment plan. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about the uh, sky uh, uh, description of stages of cardiogenic shock. And you were the president of sky for a certain period of time uh -huh. and also editor of chief of the Sky Journal, which is a journal of cath, cath and cardiovascular intervention. And uh, <clears throat> you have many other accolades as well. But uh, you also participated in this particular uh, design of the cardiogenic shock criteria and stages. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, uh, so as we looked at all of the different trials, everyone used a different definition. And we found we couldn't really discriminate you, you know, you either had shock or you didn't, but we couldn't tell if you were at early stages or not. And so we came up with a very simple classification. You don't have to have an app on your phone and you can figure it out. So uh, some patients are simply at risk. They don't really have shock, but you need to know they could. And some people are just starting. Some people really have the classic shock. Uh, and so that we named that A, B, and C. Classic for classic, B for beginning, A at at risk. And we talked about deteriorating, meaning you're treating them, but they're getting worse. And lastly is, are they an extremist so severe that again, nothing's working? What we're hopeful is that that will allow us as we go forward with trials to more clearly identify who we're treating because we think that makes a difference and why we've had some problems showing benefit. Uh, 
And secondly, we want you to be able to communicate among ourselves. I want to be able to tell you, I'm mm. sending you a, a Sky D shock patient. Shock, right. You're going to know right away how mm -hmm. sick that patient is. And it makes a difference. So there now are a number of studies that have confirmed that. Mayo Clinic uh, uh, has a trial that's shown here that uh, what you can see is that those people that are in that class A really are doing well and are going to do well. But just being from class A to class B is an increase of mortality at 30 days by 25%. Mm -hmm. So even though they don't really have shock, mm. they're at that tipping point where they're going to have a much worse outcome. And of course, if you're worse than that, then your numbers start to look as we've seen classic shock numbers. And this is clearly shown in this graph, which is quite impressive as far as the differences are concerned between A and E. Exactly. So that's, that's very dramatic, it, telling it, you that this classification is very useful and uh, very convincing. And in fact, the class C is right where we'd expect it to be, about 50% mortality. So now we've got a way of saying, what is our expected benefit and how do we treat them? Excellent. So tell us a little bit about algorithm for shock and uh, what, what criteria do we use to uh, make a proper diagnosis? Well, I think one of the things we've learned is that we have to have a, a playbook. We have to understand what we do and how we do it. And so here from the uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology is an approach that I think most of us adopted. So it starts with clinical assessment. How does a patient look? What's her blood pressure? Are they cold and clammy? It adds the labs that are incredibly important, lactate being uh, one of the most important labs that we get. It tells us that we need to assess the patient very early on for right ventricular involvement. 40% of patients will have right and left ventricular involvement. I think we've ignored that and we haven't treated it. So we now know we need to do that quicker. And then from there you can decide are they likely to respond to pharmacologic therapy or are they going to require something additional. Excellent. So <clears throat> in few words, what are the goals of therapy for treatment of cardiogenic shock? Well, there really are three things that we need to do. Uh, we need to help the patient. So we need to treat the hypoperfusion and, and avoid accumulation of lactic acid. We know across the spectrum that is incredibly predictive. We need to treat the ventricle. We need to help the ventricle uh, during this acute phase so that it can improve and heal. And so that's the point where we have to decrease filling pressures towards normal if possible. We know that there's going to be remodeling events that occur. We want to limit that. We want to improve the overall prognosis by decreasing the pulmonary congestive symptoms because of its effect. And lastly, we need to provide blood flow in the ischemic state to these hearts. So this is, is this right across the board for all the types of cardiogenic shock or is it just particularly related to uh, ischemic myocardium in this particular uh, image that you have shown here? Yeah, no, it's across the board across because the if board. you think about it, even if it's non-ischemic, Mm -hmm. If you can't perfuse the myocardium because your transmyocardial pressure is low, EDP is high, right. diastolic pressure is low, mm -hmm. doesn't matter if you've got coronary blockages or not, you still are going to have a, an ischemic process and a myocardial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about uh, pharmacology. I mean, this has existed for a long period of time, and this was basically the mainstay of therapy for a very long period of time until... Uh, intraortic balloon pump appeared and then many other mechanical support devices. Uh, so what has been a standard of care in the past and do we have anything new related to uh, pharmacology for treatment of cardiogenic shock? Well, I think we have uh, some, some confirmations and that is that uh, we really want to uh, try to avoid arrhythmias. We want to increase uh, you know, the contractile function, and the agent that has consistently done that for us is norepinephrine. Uh, you don't get the arrhythmias, you get a, a fairly, you get a much better alpha than beta effect, and that works pretty well. I think I'm excited about the use of some of the new calcium-specific agents, because that's really the altered problem that we have at myocardium, and uh, levosomendrin uh, is an agent that we're seeing increasingly used in non-ischemic, but now, now pushing over into these acute cardiogenic shock patients. And uh, so some of those uh, drug substances uh, increased the heart rate, and that was certainly of concern in a lot of scenarios, particularly with ischemic myocardium. So what, what, what is your opinion now on this well, I, I, issue? Well, I, clearly increasing heart rate acts at, at that cellular level, and unloading uh, can't help that. And so anything we can do to avoid that, is going to give us better basal function and less myocardial oxygen consumption. So mm. we, don't want to, we don't want to increase the heart rate. Right. 
sounds good. Well, uh, a variety of devices have appeared in the last several decades. As I mentioned, interesting balloon pump was the first mm -hmm. one, but there are many other ones available. And uh, so how do they affect uh, cardiac function and how important are they in treatment of cardiogenic shock? Well, I think that, that knowing how they affect the heart is incredibly important in our decisions about how to treat. And we're learning how to combine those. So if we look at pharmacotherapy or pharmacotherapy with balloon pump, we do increase the overall cardiac performance. We increase cardiac output. But we have a net negative uh, effect on the heart, uh, looking at pressure volume areas, which is a measure of the work done. Which is nicely shown in this graph. Shown in this graph. Right. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about mechanical support. What is available? How briefly, how do they work? Uh, what is your first choice and second choice? And do you combine them sometimes? Uh, and this is nicely represented here in this image. Uh, let's go through those quickly and uh, get some additional information, how to use them and when to use them. So the balloon pump, I think, is this, the one that we've all used and I think we're most comfortable with. It's like our, you know, warm coat. Uh, but uh, it, it really hasn't given us as much benefit as we need. Uh, and I think when we look particularly at cardiogenic shock, the amount of unloading of the ventricle versus the amount of perfusion has been limited. Uh, but it's still there and we still use it. I'm excited about the, the new axial flow pumps. Uh, Impella, Impella CP in particular is the one we use percutaneously. There are other versions like the PHP that both, uh, all of those work to suck blood out of the LV, empty it into the aorta, so the LV volume and pressure is diminished, which decreases significantly myocardial oxygen need. Tandem Heart uh, and uh, VA ECMO really are pumps uh, that remove blood and then re you know, replace the blood, but they do so in a way that increases the volume and pressure that the left ventricle sees. So they are very effective at increasing cardiac output, but the, the increase in the amount of oxygen needed is disproportionate and can be a problem. The right side of the heart, as I mentioned, I think we would neglected, but today we're excited about having axial flow devices like the Impella uh, or VA ECMO uh, that help with that, and of course, Centrif uh, uh, Tandem has an RVAD form as well as Protec. So, you know, several different ways of looking at that. As you ask the question, because these act differently, I think one of the opportunities we're going to have is to think about how we combine them. Mm -hmm. It's expensive in terms of thinking about technology, but if you think about the benefit and patient outcomes, saving that life, decreasing the time in the hospital, avoiding subsequent myocardial dysfunction may well be worth it. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, as is clearly shown here, we go from a, the simplest one, which is intraortic balloon pump as far as placement is concerned, and the time involved to achieve whatever goal you want to achieve, to the more complicated ones uh, with ECMO and so on. Mm -hmm. are, are there some newer technologies that are emerging, or will be emerging probably in the next four or five years, where we will have an option to uh, use them either on temporary basis or maybe on a little bit longer term basis for treatment of, uh, well, cardiogenic shock, but also for patients with uh, maybe not uh, uh, cardiogenic shock, but uh, class four congestive heart failure or even class three congestive heart failure. We're a little bit diverging from cardiogenic <laughs> shock, but I'm sure that our audience would like to know what else might be available? I know that one of them here is being uh, uh, actually uh, <clears throat> evaluated uh, or was designed at our institution, mm -hmm. so-called Presirian. But there are other ones like uh, Second Heart Assist and uh, other companies also working on it. Uh, do you think that this might also have an impact to a certain degree in treatment of cardiogenic shock? Or this is designed for other type of heart failure? So I think that uh, we're going to see an adoption of those. I think that, you know, as we've, you know, gotten to the point where they're miniaturized but can either be temporary or permanent, I, I think it's, we will get a point where we will put them in and leave them uh, and then decide to take them out or not. Uh, hmm. And that makes the most sense for patients. Then, then when you start to wean, you have support in case they don't wean. And I really believe that's a huge hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, models of uh, cardiac uh, mechanical support as far as heart function is concerned. Uh, 
Can you explain a little bit to what is shown in this particular <laughs> well, slide? This slide uh, shows something that is near and dear to hemodynamicists, and that's actually how the heart works. And you see on the bottom what the pressure inside of the heart is at the end of diastole, and the top uh, straight line is what the pressure is that's developed. And in between, you can see how much blood gets ejected with stroke work. And you can see, if you look at the left-hand panel, that the heart is operating at the lower end of that curve. So it's the end diastolic pressure is lower, and there's lower volume. So it tells you there's less work. If you look on the right-hand panel, you can see that the, the uh, pressures are higher there at the bottom. So right. it's working harder, and it's having to eject against more pressure. And the, and the sizes are larger, so the volume of the ventricle is larger, all of which uh, go along with what we talked about before, harder work being performed, but more cardiac output in the ECMO, uh, uh, somewhat less work, but a lot less energy being expended right. to do it in the impella. Mm -hmm. So uh, explain to us about uh, device summary as far as uh, cardiac powder, uh, power and myocardial protection is concerned, looking at inotropes and all of the other mechanical assist devices. So the pressure volume loops are sort of hard to follow, but this is a single chart that, that reduces that into telling us about all of these improve how much uh, heart function there is, the cardiac power, so uh, right. the, the, here that we see the green. Uh, the myocardial protection, that pressure volume area, tells us how much work the heart has to do to do that. And you can see in the orange or red uh, that uh, most of those have a, a large amount of energy expended in exchange for generating more output. Uh, the impella seems to have, uh, you know, a little bit of the best of both. Uh, so you don't work as hard, and you still get a, an increase in cardiac output. And that's, that's how we think uh, uh, we are going to help the hearts heal better through this process. So uh, looking at this uh, information, uh, obviously just looking at Impella, there is a big difference between 2.5 and 5. Yep. How do you decide when to use a smaller Impella with less output versus bigger Impella? when to use tandem heart and when to use ECMO. All of those are available to you, so how do you make the decision? Well, uh, actually I don't have tandem heart. So one okay. of the points <laughs> it brings up is what do you have at your center? And very few places have all of these. So right. they are contrast and compare. Right. Uh, but this, can, I think, informs us about how we might make that choice to do that. Mm -hmm. So in our choice, it really is dependent upon how profound the lack of cardiac output is. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the Impella 5.0 is typically a large bore, either surgical or now we do it percutaneously, right. subclavian. Mm -hmm. um, but the standard is that 2.5 or, or 3 OCP, so it's a moderate mm -hmm. cardiac output. Mm -hmm. That may not be enough. Maybe not and be so enough. if it's not enough, then you'll think about getting the, the larger, more capable device or combining devices. I see. So, uh, and this graph shows actually when you have combining mechanical support. So if you can explain a little bit the differences uh, uh, between uh, using combined versus uh, single device. So we uh, addressed in the last slide the fact that ECMO gives a lot of cardiac output increase, but takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. We showed that the Impella gives you a little bit of cardiac output, gives you a lot less work. And so the combination of those two therapies, ECMO and Impella, combined to ECPELA, which is what you see right. here, compared to just ECMO alone. And you can see in this small series uh, both a short-term and a long-term benefit of that combined therapy. So it suggests to us a signal that these kinds of combinations to get optimal therapy, adjusting the pharmacotherapy, adjusting the mechanical support, may pay benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not simply using the device, mm -hmm. but optimizing the therapy. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting, and you kind of alluded to it, that not all centers have all those mechanical support devices available. You might have one or two, but you might not have four of them or even mm -hmm. more. So that, that is an issue and a dilemma. So do you think that, uh, therefore, there should be places, what we call centers of excellence, that uh, can manage the most complex cardiogenic shock and that patients should have priority to be transferred to those institutions? I absolutely do. This is akin to trauma, to stroke, to any other very complicated patient group that requires not just you and I, but the team we surround ourselves with. We have to have excellent heart failure doctors and surgeons and nurses and other people. 
So, I mean, I, I do see the rise of that occurring, and I think that we'll see uh, truly, you know, advances uh, in care. So what, what is a typical team that you uh, assembled at your institution uh, to properly manage uh, patients with cardiogenic shock? So in patients, we really bring uh, folks that represent uh, the entire group. So we have not only interventionalists and the techs and nurses from the cath lab, but we want the heart failure individuals. We want imaging, so we're going to be up front with echo. Uh, we have nursing teams involved with, with our highest level of care of nurses. Uh, I bring pharmacists, respiratory therapists, because of the need for you know, rapid pharmacologic management, potential intubation. And quite honestly, in the most sick patients, I'm looking at my palliative care team so that mm. we can intervene early and, and help people have appropriate expectations. Very interesting and important thing to consider. So uh, in the last four decades, we have made tremendous strides and progress as far as cardiogenic shock is concerned, where four decades ago, what mortality was 90%, and we are now, what, close to around 50% or so? Yeah, I think uh, most centers through 2016 would tell us we're about 50%. So uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, improved outcomes, uh, and maybe you can discuss this a little bit. Where are we now? Well, I think centers that have begun to develop processes like we talked about, we did the algorithm, they have put in place these other checkpoints uh, and are, are active very early, are beginning to show the, the benefits of that. And so here we can see from this slide, you know, the mortalities that we had, uh, the survivorship, and again, they're in the 50% range. That's what we've seen because we just haven't been able to change that. But if you look at the Denger and the NSCI initiative, the National Cardiac Stroke Initiative, which uh, has just you know been in place for for a couple of years with Dr. O'Neill and others leading it. I think we are beginning to see if you understand the patient and you optimize the therapies, even if combining therapies, all of that, that we can get to 75, maybe even higher percent survival. Mm -hmm. So imagine if we flip that chart, and instead of 10 percent survival, we had 10 percent mortality, 90 percent survival, and I think that's achievable. So. Uh I have no doubt that early recognition is number one priority and then proper triage and then referring patient or sending the patient to the center of excellence to the institution that can handle the most complex scenarios. And it requires us as interventionalists mm -hmm. to be able to, to take that step and say, here's what's best for my patient, not necessarily how I'm most invested. So what are current recommendations as far as patient management is concerned? patients with cardiogenic shock? Uh, well, obviously we have the acute management uh, and, uh, and with all the other pharmacotherapies that would go along with acute myocardial ischemia, except for beta blockers. Hmm. And so I find it, you know, I've, I've always found it challenging because we do have data from animals in, in limited studies that say that the introduction early beta blockers not just decrease arrhythmic deaths, right. but also improve overall myocardial uh, healing afterwards. And, Here's a slide that addresses that, talking about the idea of we couldn't use beta blockers because patients were already hypotensive and we right. could make them up more. Mm -hmm. But if we could stabilize their blood pressure and then give them a heart rate specific agent, heart rate specific because that's a piece of the cardiac cycle that unloading doesn't affect. We don't decrease the work that way. So we should be able to get more benefit now that we have a stable patient that we could also add a beta blocker too. Here's a very interesting animal trial in which they did just that. They used the equivalent of impella unloading and then looked at adding uh, ivabradidine, which is simply a heart rate lowering agent. Doesn't have any inotropic, it's purely chronotropic. Right. And here what you can see is that there's a marked decrease in the total myocardial infarction that occurs with that combination of therapy. And I think that's an exciting opportunity for us as we go forward to think about a next step that we might pursue. Excellent. Well, uh, Dr. Bailey, thank you very much for this uh, very informative uh, presentation on the cardiogenic shock 2020. Where do we stand now? And what is missing? And what the future might hold? And uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. You've been a friend for a very long period of time. I work with you on many, many different projects. Back when uh, we both had dark hair. Exactly. <laughs> I wanted to congratulate you on, on all of your achievements, uh, leading uh, Sky Society of Cardiac Angiography Intervention for a long period of time.
doing an excellent job as a chief editor and uh, scientist as well, researcher, and now also in charge of a medical uh, facility at uh, LSU in Shreveport, Louisiana. Well, you're very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. My Dr. pleasure to see you and be with you for thank this presentation. Well, thank you, and I appreciate your audience as well. Okay.